I do know what I want to talk about today, and I want you to hear me. How many of y'all have been going through um, a lot in your life and, and you're uncomfortable? Let me see your hands if you're uncomfortable. I want to see the hands of all the uncomfortable people. You don't like how this thing feel. You know the Lord said it. You understand that you got to go through it, and you're going to do it because the Lord said so. But if you had your way, holler at your boy. Anybody, I'm, I'm looking for you. Like, if you had your way, you wouldn't pick this way. You're going this way with the Lord, but if you had your choice. <clears throat> this is what the Lord told me to talk to you about today. The name of my sermon is called, Become Comfortable with the Course. I want you to become comfortable with the course because if God changes what you're going through, you're going to miss what he has for you. If it was going to be easy, then everybody would do it. Sometimes God puts difficulty on the course to decide who wants it bad enough to stay in the process even when you're not comfortable. And let me tell you why some of you all are going to get it and others are not. You're going to get it because something in your life made you tough enough to be able to stand in the fight even if you're losing. How many fighters do I have in the room? This is the kind of fighter I am. I don't proclaim to be able to beat anybody. But one thing I can guarantee you is if you get in a fight with me, once it's over, they gonna know you was in a fight. Now, I don't know if, I, I don't know if I'm gonna win or lose, but they gonna ask you, who is you fighting? <laughs> because see, when I'm scared, I'm dangerous. <clears throat> Anybody in here like that? I'm not, I can't wait on you to make your move. I got to go first, because I don't know what you're gonna do. And I wanna speak to people who the devil tried to take the fight out of you. All year, you, you just, how many of you just felt like I'm giving up, I'm tired, you can have it all. God told me to tell you, you gotta become comfortable with this course because weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Are y'all ready for the word? Right. So what I love about this, and I'm gonna, the reason why I'm not gonna read it is because you're gonna understand it. You already know this is the story about the children of Israel going to the Red Sea. For the first time in my life, I'm going to preach Exodus 14. And very rarely will I ever mention the Red Sea. Because the Word of God is a living, breathing organism, and if you study it properly, every time you go to it, you should find fresh oil. You, you, should, you should find fresh water. And when I looked at this text, what I love about it, and I'm already preaching, by the way, the Lord showed us in one fell swoop and with the tonality of one sentence that he was more powerful than all of the gods in Egypt combined. If I don't say nothing else, you ought to already be excited that the God you serve is stronger than every enemy you have combined. Please expand your mind. I ain't talking about your boss. I ain't talking about your sister-in-law. I'm not talking about your ex-boo. You got some enemies called cancer. You got enemies called brain tumors. You have enemies called witches, warlocks, hexes, and curses. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but of principalities and spirits, high, uh, high spirits and wickedness in high places. And I want you to know that all of those are your enemies. And God is basically saying through this text that no matter what is going on in your life, I alone am more powerful than every obstacle and obstruction in your life at the same time. Somebody needs to say amen. God says I'm, I'm more powerful than all the gods of Egypt. I'm more powerful than the government. I'm more powerful than the economy. I'm, I'm more powerful than all of that. And God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 9, verse 1, he says, Pharaoh, I want you to, uh, Moses, I want you to do me a favor. Um, I want uh, you to go and tell Pharaoh that I said 
let my people go. Now, how many of y'all know when you go tell somebody something, it depends on who said it? Like it's, like, it's like when we were growing up, you got siblings. I can go in my sister's room and say, wash the dishes. My sisters are looking at me and say, what? Mama said, how many of you? Because when you say mama said, so, so now this is different because, because Moses could tell them, he could tell Pharaoh to let my people go all he want, but when he goes back this time, he goes with the authority of the one who can make it happen. And he goes and he says to Pharaoh, he says, listen, uh, God told me to tell you. Now you can do what you want to do, but God told me to tell you today, not tomorrow. Don't miss every word I say today is going to be important. Today, everybody say today. Today, today he said, let my people go. And it has been almost 400 years that he has held the children of Israel in captivity. For four centuries, they've not known their last name. For four centuries, somebody said they see me, you hear me? For, for four centuries, they've been the least in a country. For 400 years, the wealth disparity between Israel and everybody else keeps widening, and the rich keep getting richer. And in their instance, the poor was getting poorer. Egypt, power, Israel. Slaves. They were slaves, literal slaves in Egypt. And after 400 years of not knowing their identity, after 400 years of not knowing who their great, 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 great grandparents were, after 400 years of not being invited to the table of reason and understanding, God in one sentence ends it all. See, this is why most of us struggle is because we don't trust that God, whenever he feels like it, can put an end to the struggle you're in right now. Oh, you didn't hear me. It don't take no whole lot of planning. It don't have to be your season. It don't have to, all God has to do is say, you know what? Today is the day that I want my daughter or my son to enjoy the benefits of the kingdom and today is the last day that I intend to let any enemy keep you in the struggle you're in. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I have been sent here to say to you online and to say to you in person that I've been given authority by the Holy Spirit to tell you that God said, black people, that for those of you who will obey him and trust his holy word, that today will be the day that he is going to end some of the struggles that has been enduring in your life since the days before you got here. God says, I'm about to break your grandmama's curse. I'm about to break your grandfather's curse over your life. And to every parent who's afraid that your child is going to grow up and be like that person in your family that nobody wants to be like, God says it's about to skip a generation. Finally, the children of Israel, Bobby, they are about to get the blessing. Remember, he promised this to Abraham. Abraham is gone. Isaac, gone. It isn't until the day of Jacob that the children of Israel get what he promised Abraham. See, you don't have the benefit of knowing what God promised your great-grandparents. You, you don't know when your ancestors were on the slave ships coming to America. You don't know what God promised them while they were praying stuffed in the holes of ships. You don't, see, this is, I can tell you, this is going to be a consequential sermon. People of other ethnicities, they can trace their roots and they can know where their great, 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 great grandmama came from. But us, we don't have the benefit of knowing. And since you don't know where you came from, typically you don't know where you're going. 
But God sent me here to take, today to tell you through clairvoyance, <laughs> to tell you through mind stuff, to tell you through prayer and meditation, to tell you that your great, 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 great grandfather in a slave ship was saying, God, make sure that my great, 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 great granddaughter doesn't have to endure what I'm enduring right now. And God told me to tell you to slap your neighbor and say, baby, it's the day of Jacob. The blessing that God had over your ancestors is about to rest on your house. God is about to finally open a door that no man can close. And he's about to shut a door that no man can open. You know, you're not getting this because you don't even know the tactics the devil has for your daughter. You, you're not even thinking. See, the reason why you're not feeling this message is you sit up here thinking about bills. I'm talking about your grandbaby. I'm talking about your daughter. I'm talking about your unborn grandchildren. And I am telling you today that we standing in the gap telling the devil that was the last generation that you're gonna have anybody in my family addicted to drugs. That was the last generation. That was the last generation of unbelievers. That was it. I am cutting the umbilical cord between the stillborn youthfulness that the enemy has taken from your family. And I've come to tell you that you are gonna have life and have that life. Who is this message for today? Now, this next point that I'm about to give you, I don't have a sermon, I'm just, I'm just talking to my people. The next point that I'm about to give you, I'm about to smack you in your head. I ain't gonna lie to you. It's about to be rough. Slap your name and say, it's about to be, it's about to be rough up in this piece. It's about to be rough. Okay. Okay. Do you all hear me online? It's, it's about to get rough because you're going to have to take some accountability for this one right here. You're going this is this one, this one is on us. Okay? We're going to have to take some accountability up and through here. The Bible says that when Moses got to Pharaoh to tell him to let his people go, the children of Israel had already gone to Pharaoh and said, <laughs> You see what happened when you mess with us? All them flies, all them frogs, all them gnats, all them locusts, your water done turned to blood. See, people don't know what, what, what messing with you will cost them. Problem is, is that messing with me, you ain't gotta worry about me. You gotta worry about my daddy, now come on. Touch your neighbor and say, you messing with me, you messing with my daddy. It got so bad that Israel was like, we want to go. Egypt was like, please go. And they said, okay, we going to leave. Now, you always got to try your luck on your way out. Uh, do you mind if we get some gold and some silver? They wanted them gone so bad that they gave them gold and silver to leave. But that's the scripture that they were slaves yesterday, millionaires today. God. Yesterday, they were building bricks and waiting on Pharaoh to give them whatever he thought. Today, they fully dressed in Bottega. Fully dressed with gold and silver in their pocket. That's how fast God can turn it around. Now, black people, come here. Because, see, y'all about to shout with the gold, but if I don't show you what to do with this gold, you're going to be back in slavery. Because the Bible says that the borrower 
is slave to the lender. And this is what has happened with black people. We got off the boat and went right back into slavery. Now, let me tell you why. Because when they got gold and silver, the Bible says the first thing they did was build the tabernacle. Mm. So when you get in the tabernacle, you walk in, there's a golden lampstand. You walk in, there's a, a table of showbread. You walk in, there is, there, there's gold in the Ark of the Covenant, inlaid and outlaid. They built everything in the tabernacle out of gold because the thing that they got from the Egyptians, they built something with it. Y'all better hear me. Now, now, let me tell you something. In America right now, there are 65 million Hispanics. I want to talk about the two biggest minority clumps in America, 65 million Hispanics documented in America spent $2 trillion on consumer goods. There are 42 million black people and we spent 1.6 trillion. How in the world does a people group have almost 25 million more people and we almost spent the same? Because, oh God, y'all ain't, I told you this is going, the reason is because the first shift of wealth that God gives you, you're supposed to build something with it. The reason why we're still in slavery is because we bought first. All right. I know you ain't going to say amen. I know you ain't going to like it. Touch your neighbor and say, it's Black History Month. And this ain't just a month for white folks to make you feel comfortable. This is the time for you to look yourself in the mirror and find out what we can do as a people to make it impossible to keep us locked up. It ain't Black History Month because Target makes a donation to the NAACP. Forget that stuff. It's, it's, it's Black History Month when we get to the place where we don't need the donation. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care how mad you are. I know you came ready to shout. You're going to shout later, but you're going to learn today. Slap your name and say, you're going to learn today. <laughs> Our problem as a people is that we bought before we built. And as soon as you got your little job, first thing you did is you went and over leveraged yourself and bought a house in somebody's suburb. You got a $900 car note, and now you have to alter every day praying for God to help you sustain what you thought was a blessing. If it was a blessing, you wouldn't have to pray to take care of it. The Bible says that the Lord addeth and there is no sorrow. So, so, so when he gives it to you, there is no sorrow. That's how you know it's a blessing. The Lord maketh rich and add no sorrow. So, so the fact that you got to come up here and get a miracle to pay your mortgage meant that you bought before you built. And that's why we are slaves. Because when we got our goal, we put it around our neck and on our teeth. And I need you to take it off your neck and off your teeth and go get you some real estate. I don't care. I don't care. I'm tired of going to the mall and seeing Louis Vuitton and Gucci with 7,000 people in line and 6,900 of them black. And I know what you're saying. You got on Gucci? I do, but my bill's paid. And I bought my Gucci with my interest, not my principal. Now say something about that. Yeah, I do got some. But I built first. And for those of y'all who've been with me over the last 13 years, I ain't had no Gucci when you first got here. But how many of y'all remember? I was wearing Cole Hans when you first got here. Come on, holler at your boy. I ain't wearing them no more. I ain't got to. Because I built first. And then I bought. And you are in trouble in this room because you got everything that you want and you are begging for everything you need. 
Do me a favor. Look at all these crazy people in here looking at me like I'm talking. Look at them. Look at them. They're looking at me like I'm saying something wrong. I am your pastor. It ain't just my job to make you shout. It's my job to make you think. Now, this is good church whether you like it or not. I'm tired, ladies and gentlemen, of you shouting for a miracle. Some of the stuff you're praying for, you ought to just be able to go do. I ain't going to pray to buy my kids none for Christmas. I don't need a miracle to go back to school shopping. But we use our gold to buy. Stop telling me you ain't got no money when you spent $1.6 trillion. It is not that you don't have money. It is that you do, not how, you do not know how to handle it. You did not do the right thing with it. And you bought what would give you instantaneous gratification only to find out that you can be depressed with a YSL purse. That you can be depressed with a Hermes bag. That you can be depressed in them new square heels y'all wearing with the look. You know the ones. Them Bottega ones. They look like they've been sold together. That you can be insecure with an Escalade. That you can have a Bentley in the garage and still want to blow your brains out. And you haven't figured out yet that buying does not make you feel better? Let me tell you when you'll feel better. When you build something. Now do me a favor. Slap your neighbor and say, he right whether you're going to look sad and ashy or not. I know I'm talking right. I don't care what you got to say about it. I'm preaching. Somebody got to tell you. Everybody else in your life scared to tell you because you're going to go off on them. I bet you won't go off on me. I'm talking to you right now in your face telling you we got to do better. You put that in your pipe and smoke it. Say whatever you want online, but I'm talking good in here today. When you finally start making money, that ain't your signal to get a bigger house yet. I was making money still in a two-bedroom apartment. Are you listening to me? Because I knew that my first job was to build something, which is why when we bought this church, I was able to write the check because had I leveraged it on depreciating assets, we wouldn't be in this room today. Think about that. You have to build before you buy. Don't nobody care that your sunglasses got a T on the frame. I know some blue blockers that work just as well. Y'all don't remember no blue blockers because y'all too, y'all too bougie. How many of y'all these blue blockers? Y'all remember that? You know you're in the wrong store when you're around trying to pull a tag out talking about how much this costs. Get out. You don't supposed to be in there. Get out. How much this is. And whenever you got to pull your calculator out to start. And you sitting up here trying to figure out if you spend this, if it's going to affect that. You're in the wrong place. I'd rather you go to Target and come in here with some confidence and cash. They're being prouder and come in here talking about, Lord, I need a miracle every day and every hour. Stay your butt at home. I know you ain't going to like it, but I, I'm here. Touch your name and say, he ain't going nowhere either. I came to fight. I feel violent today. There's a wealth transfer happening right now. Did you not know in 1990, it was only 65 
black millionaires in America. 65. 2023, it's only 2 million of us. That's terrible. Did I say 2 million of them? Lord, forgive me. I didn't. <laughs> y'all, 2 million of y'all. <laughs> I'm struggling. I'm just trying to make it. <laughs> it's only 2 million millionaires in America. That's horrible. As brilliant as you are. As smart as you are, as talented as you are, two million out of 42 million? That means 40 million of us are somewhere between poverty and middle class. No wonder we got to do GoFundMe's to bury our people. Is it Black History Month or is it Easter? I don't know which one it is, because y'all. <laughs> Who said that? You stand up. You stand up. Y'all give her a hand. God bless you, sister. Y'all thank my staff. They done got me a battery up here. Y'all in trouble now. It ain't about to cut off. Two million. It's not, listen, not two million people who made a million dollars. Only two million got it left. Because I bet you, if you add up the money you've made over the last 20 years, ain't nowhere in the world you shouldn't be clawing at it. You might not be a millionaire, but you ought to at least have two, three hundred thousand dollars in the bank. But we don't, because they knocking us over the head. They, they got y'all, they got y'all flying to other states to get your hair done. Talking about, well, they know how to do my hair. You ain't. Look, let me. I'm about to talk to y'all because I'm so sick of y'all. Y'all don't get on my nerve. You ain't got no business flying to Atlanta just to get your hair done. And you ain't got it like that. It was, a, it was a, the plane ticket, the hotel room, the food. You just spent $5,000 on the hairdo. That's going to be done before you get back. Because if it's humidity, your edge is gone. The leave out going to be poofy. Oh, so you going to act like I don't know what I'm talking about? I do, bro. Y'all looking at me? Are y'all listening to me? Am I talking to you? Am I talking to somebody else? We doing too much. Eating out every weekend. Out at Mastro's freezing with your little dress on, trying to wait till you can get in. And after, after about four lemon drops, you done spent your whole month budget right there. <laughs> Come here. I ain't finished with you. I'm, the rest of the sermon is good. This part, I'm getting you. Black people, listen to your pastor. You're doing too much. Bro, if you don't got a college fund for your kids and you got four cars, something wrong. Something's wrong. And ain't nobody telling us this because everybody doing it for the ground. And you up here trying to keep up with people who pose in front of other people's cars. I came, out to, I came out to mall the other day. They had a whole photo shoot on my car. I just sat there and watched them. 
Now somebody thinks that that's theirs. We doing too much. And we're struggling. We're struggling. We got a whole generation of kids waiting on us to scale and we're struggling. And I'm sick of watching our people Struggle in areas we don't necessarily have to struggle in. Anybody else tired or is it just me? They used their first shift to build. So when God does bless you with this job, and when he does cause your student loans to disappear, your student loan money doesn't become shopping money. It becomes investment capital. There's a young lady in here right now. I'm not going to call her out, so you don't have to worry about that. I was in the car wash yesterday. This young lady walks up to me, and she looks at me, and she sparks up a conversation. And she says to me, no, this is good. This is good news. I got some fighters in here. They be ready to fight. This is good news. Lady came up to me and she started telling me how our ministry has blessed her life. She's here today and she's getting ready to build something. And I said, you should come to church tomorrow because the Lord gave me a revelation on this and she's here today. Y'all praise God for people who are obedient. I told her, when you find the place that God wants you to have, I want you to do one thing. I gave her a scripture. I said, I want you to write this scripture on this side. I want you to flip the other side over, and I want you to write the address to the building that you don't have yet. Then I want you to put it in your shoe, because the Bible says everywhere your foot shall tread, he will give it to you. And I am telling you right now that I'm believing God is going to give her exactly what she's been praying for. I don't know about you, but I am praying that God gives us the faith to blow up. I'm looking for millionaires to pop up all over this room. I'm looking for debts to be canceled. I'm looking for black people to own schools. I'm looking for you to not just want an education, but to provide an education. I am looking for you to rise up. Do I have anybody in this room and online that says, this is my year of manifested promises, and I can't speak for the person who's offended sitting next to me, but as for me and my house, we are getting ready to do everything that God has for us. I'm not scared about it. I'm not afraid about it. I'm going, to, I'm going to go after it. If I'm talking to you, make some noise. By this time next year, I'm looking for you to have the gold in the bank and not around your neck. Your houses are going to be paid off. so we can have another conversation because I can tell you that once we have another conversation, it is okay for you to get in debt again. But I'm not talking about consumer debt because there you get to another level where debt is your friend. But we can't get there until you have the correct mindset about money. I want you to trade in these high interest credit cards and I want you to get one that you can pay off before the month is over so that you don't have to use your money to pay interest. See, y'all don't want to hear this. Y'all don't want to hear it. But I'm preaching the word of God in this place today. The Bible says that, Proverbs 22 and 7, that the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. So until you stop being a borrower, you cannot stop being a slave. Are you listening to me? And in one moment, God got them out of Egypt and they had gold. Here's the two slaveries God ended at once. He ended physical slavery and he ended financial slavery. And I don't want you slaves to the bank the rest of your life. Because let me tell you something. If you got a house and you got a mortgage, you do not own it, the bank owns it. And if your rate isn't fixed, and you got a balloon trying to get in it, raise your hand if I'm talking to you. I know it. And you got a balloon to get in it, 
it will destroy your life because you will go to bed with a $2,000 mortgage and wake up with a $6,000 mortgage and ain't nothing you can do about it. Listen to your pastor. Do not fall victim to these five, six, and seven-year arms. If you can't get it fixed, walk away from it. Come on, y'all. Which means that this might be the season for you to continue to rent until you can get a big enough down payment to make sure. You don't want to hear me. All right, let me move on. Let me get to the word. How many of y'all, who, who, who nerve I'm getting on right now? Good, I'm going to stay with it then. Because let me tell you what Exodus 12 and 42 said. Are you ready for this? I said, are you ready for this? After they built it, after God gave them the money, here's what the Bible says. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says that after God did it, it was a night worth remembering. Because when God finally does what he's going to do in your life, something in your spirit is going to leap and say, this is the night where God turned everything around for me. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God told me to say, this is the day. You will always remember this sermon, whether you liked it or not, whether you shouted or not, whether you were influenced or whether you were affected. This will be the day you will remember that everything in your life changed around. I decree and declare that this is the year where you will not have to worry about how you're going to pay your bills. I decree and declare that this is the year where you're not going to have to work overtime just to be able to stay in your house. I decree and... Who, who am I talking to? That means you're going to have to change up how you do things. And here's what I'm telling you. You're going to have to be comfortable with this course. You're going to have to be comfortable with going to the mall and walking out with nothing. You're about to get on my nerve now. I'm trying not to fuss. I'm trying to preach. This is going to be the year where you're going to have to get your nails done every other week. Uh-huh. See, you ain't ready. This is going to be the year. I'm talking to somebody. This is going to be the year where you're going to have to change it. One week you're going to have to get a manicure. Next week you're going to have to get a pedicure. Or you're going to have to wear closed toe shoes all winter because this is the... you. Somebody shout, God, God. Change, change my course. Debt is slavery. Debt has y'all cussing each other out, husband and wife. Debt has you not answering your phone. Who that is? I don't recognize that number. Don't answer that. Who been there? Debt. Black people. Please hear me, because y'all gonna make me cry. I'm gonna preach all this, and you're gonna leave out of here and go straight to Papa Dose. <laughs> and spend $85. Talking about, you heard that sermon? It was good, uh huh? But you ain't even supposed to be there. I don't know what else I can say about debt. I don't know what else I can say about it. But I'm telling you right now, it is, the, it is one of the biggest form of slavery that has us locked up right now. And it keeps us locked out because when the real opportunity comes, you can't take advantage of it because you don't have the money to take advantage of it. You need money so that when God does put your name on somebody's mind, and they say, hey, if you can invest on this level, this is your return. You need to be able to do it, and you don't need to be sitting back to, I wish I could, but I can't because I just, I just put my deposit down on Cancun. 
Cancun. That's why you still want to go? Okay. That's your idea of a great trip? You got this whole big old world out here and you still talking about Cabo? No, you need to be somewhere else off the Amalfi Coast. You need to be somewhere, no, let me stop. The whole world is out here. You can't get to the other part of the world because you're already spent before you get to Galveston. So now you gotta go to Kima because you couldn't budget. Tell your neighbor, I know you mad. And here's what your pastor got to say. It's tight, but it's right. They might not get a lot of views on this, but if we get some millionaires to start popping up all around the world, I would have done my job. I'm not worried about no views today. I'm worried about impact. I don't care who watches it, God. Make sure it gets to the person who it's for. And the rest of y'all can take a nap until I'm done. Some of these people didn't have mothers and fathers and uncles to tell them this stuff. This is the first time they're having it in their life. And so even though this part of the sermon ain't for you, can you be patient enough so it can hit the person it's for? Because God is working in this room right now and some minds are being changed and they don't need to be sitting in between somebody impatient talking about, this ain't for me. Because I ain't finished because I'm coming for you next. Everybody say debt. Now, for all of the people who ain't got debt, here's your struggle, detours. Come here, people who got a little something. Come here, people who built a little something in your life. Because, see, when you built something in your life, you think that the knowledge that you have will be enough to get you to the next stage. So the hardest person in the world to affect change to in their mind is somebody who has done something with the mindset that they currently have. Because now they got a little something. Here's what they're talking about. Moses, you should have left us back there. Because at least back there, we wasn't. Did you bring us out here to kill us? Did you bring us out here because of all of these graves out here? Look at what God tells them. Now, if you look at any map, y'all still with me? If you look at any map, there is a direct route from Egypt to Canaan. And here's what the Lord told him. Now, this is like saying, I want you to go from, uh, from Humble and I want you to go downtown. Everybody know you can take 59 going straight there. This is what God told him. All right. Uh, Israel, I want you to turn and camp at Pihaharath. And then I want you to go between Migdal and the sea. And then I want you to go over against Baal Zephon. In other words, I want you to go downtown, but I want you to take 59 north. Exit and make a U-turn. Go 59 south. Get off at Lyons Avenue. I'm in y'all hood, ain't it? I know what set you claiming. Get off at Lyons. And, and he, tells him, he tells him to go all over the place. And do you know how upset they are with God because they know a better route than the one God just told them to take? Mm. But see, when you've been in slavery, you are in a hurry. So now God is talking about go this way and go that way and go this way, and they're frustrated. Now, now how many of you all um, a mama used to have, I, I said this at the conference, how many of y'all used to have fish growing up? Anybody have fish? So when, when we had fish growing up, my mother would go buy the goldfish and she, it would come in a bag. How many of y'all had a bag fish, you know? And so what you do with the bag is you put it in water, in the bag, with water that came out of the tank. Why? So that the water in the bag can match the temperature of the tank. Because if you put the fish from the bag to the tank, you're gonna shock it. Oh, you missed that. If, if, if you give them the, if you release the bag too early. <laughs> you, got, you gotta get them ready for the bag because if, if you don't get them ready, then when they get in the tank, they're gonna be shocked. So, so God 
taking them the long way around was getting them acclimatized to the temperature of where they were going. But if they would have went straight from slavery, straight to Canaan. So sometimes the detour is saving your life. Sometimes God taking you the long way around is keeping you from dying in the process. Because if you read Deuteronomy chapter number seven, the Bible says, when you get to Canaan, there are going to be the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, seven nations stronger than you. So if God would have taken them from slavery directly to Canaan, plus seven nations stronger than them, and Egypt behind them, had he not taken them on the detour, they would have had eight enemies instead of seven. Sometimes God takes you the long way around is because the route is designed to kill your enemies, not to confuse you. Oh, God, help me in this place today. I am talking to somebody in here who has been frustrated with God on how long it has been taking him to get you to the place where you've been dreaming. But God says, the reason why I took you the long way around is because I knew I could give you the stamina to survive, and I'm also going to deal with your enemies along the way. Touch your neighbor and say, God took you the long way so that he could deal with your enemies. Are you listening to me? You must understand that detours is God's way of ensuring that you don't have to fight all of your enemies at the same time. You don't know how many things God blocked by adding days to your deliverance. <laughs> if you had got there when you wanted to get there, you would have had to fight Pharaoh, the Hittites. The, let me put it in your language. If you had gotten there when you wanted to get there, you would have also recognized that there was a taxation that the government was going to put on you, and you would have thought that you made a million dollars, spent 900000 not to recognize that you was going to owe the government 35%. Now you got tax debt, more slavery, and ain't no thugs like the IRS. Them some gangsters. Anybody ever had to deal with the IRS? You went and spent the money but didn't understand what a 1099 was yet? You went and spent the money and didn't recognize that the write-offs wasn't going to work? You better hear me. The long way around is for you to learn the language of where you're going. This sermon ain't for everybody. It's only for the people who who are in the year manifested promise. I'm just talking to people, because I'm telling you, by the time I get done with you this year, ain't nobody in your family gonna recognize you. You're gonna be paying bills and not even feeling it. You're gonna be giving to the poor. You're gonna be the lender and not the borrower. I'm getting you ready for the next dimension. Anybody in the balcony listening to me, I'm getting you ready for the next dimension. I am not getting you ready for where you are. You have way too much capacity to be talking about maintaining. I want you to have life and have it more abundantly. Who am I speaking to? Detours are God's way of creating space in between your crises. Hmm? Now, how many of y'all used to get bullied when you were younger? Be honest. I know everybody want to be tough and act like you was the bully. But when you had bullies growing up, you ain't go home the same way. You just... How many... <laughs> When you have bullies growing up, you went around blocks, you ain't have no business going around because you ain't wanting to be able to find you. Let me tell you something. The devil knows exactly where you want to go, but he doesn't know the route that God is going to use to get you there. Because the Bible says that Pharaoh looked at the route that they were taking and said, they confused. The Bible says that, Pastor Torrance, am I right? The Bible says that Pharaoh says, oh, leave them fools alone, they confused. Because don't nobody go to Canaan that way. Oh. So this route 
confuse the enemy. So sometimes God will have you doing stuff that don't make sense. That's why you got to have faith. God, I don't, know, I don't know what you're doing to me, but though you slay me, yet will I trust you. I don't know why I'm going back and forth, and I'm going to tell you why. It's because he has the enemy being confused because the devil's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and God makes your path complex. It makes the enemy confused. He says, what's wrong with them? Where are they going? Why are they going that way? And the Lord gave me a revelation. You got to write this down. How many of y'all ever read James 1 and 3? The Bible says that the trine of your faith does what? Worketh patience. And let patience have her what? Perfect work that you may be entire, complete. Say it again. The Bible says in the King James, it says that you may be entire, wanting nothing. Let me say that again. Let patience have her perfect work that you may be entire, wanting nothing. If you are patient, you can be complete. I'm going somewhere. Then the Lord gave me a revelation, and I wrote it down, and I wish my iPad didn't die. But I'm going to remember it because I wrote it. I found out that lack is not the absence of things. Lack is the result of no patience. You ain't never heard that. Let patience have a perfect work that you might be entire, lacking nothing. So every area of your life where you have lack is because you had no patience. Because they that wait on the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. If you got the courage to wait on God, he will make you whole. Wherever you have a deficit is because you had no patience. If you would have waited on the person God had for you and not the one you was in love with, deficit. If you'd have waited on the house God had for you and not the one you just had to have, deficit. If you'd have waited on the job that he had for you and not just something to pay the bills, deficit. Our deficits and lack are a result of a lack of patience. How many impatient people in the room? Come on. Impatient. Blood start boiling when you got to wait. <laughs> Two things you hate waiting on, your food and people. Some of y'all, if you waiting too long at the restaurant, you're going to go in the kitchen. Uh, Mr. Chef, we've been out here five hours, and them people over there came in after us, and they got their food. Yeah, because they ordered salad, and you ordered a steak, crazy. They ain't got to fry the lettuce. Impatience will make you come up with the wrong prediction. You will think that the restaurant is being racist because somebody else got bread and water and theirs came out first and you ordered a whole steak well done. Do you know how long it takes? Because you know black people don't want no blood in their meat. Uh-uh, uh-uh. This thing's still alive. I'll take that back. I don't want no blood in my meat. Uh-uh. Black people, why are we so crazy at restaurants? Uh-uh. I ordered a pepperoni pizza. What a pepperoni? She got 12 pepperonis. I got 10. I don't want it. Well, we will turn the restaurant upside down if that food don't come out right, won't we? Everybody say, be patient. Need is not the lack of possession. Need is the result of no patience. James 5 and 7 says, how the farmer waits for the fruit until it receives the rain. The path that God has you on, it's about the fruit receiving the rain, not about your ego getting results. 
God ain't in no hurry to make sure that you can get it fast so you can say, he's quicker than right now. He's an immediate God. He gonna get his praise no matter what, but he ain't gonna give you what you ready for until you ready for it. That's why I'm preaching to you today, because God's got all of this stuff stored up in heaven for us, but we as a race, as a people, we got to get ready for it. Paul said, I learned to be content in whatever state, whatever circumstance I'm in. And if you learn to see your red sea from God's perspective and not your historical data collection, because sometimes we miss God because we consult our history. I remember one time, that ain't what God doing right now. Oh, God help me right now. I remember the last time that I said, I know people like that. The last time I seen a person like that, they did it, that, that, that was then. And if you can't ever live in the present and divorce your past and history from each other, you will always be where you are. God says, listen, listen. You looking at this long path in Pharaoh like I'm trying to punish you, if you could just look at it from my perspective, you will see that I'm trying to do something far greater than you can imagine. Unfortunately, after preaching for over 20 plus years, I have learned that the most difficult thing in the world is to get people to see the benefit of seeing the situation from a perspective that they did not bring into the conversation. My hardest job as a minister is getting people to divorce their opinion based on what just happened. It, is, it almost makes the job impossible because when you cannot divorce what is happening and see it from God's perspective, then the spiritual application that I offer is to no avail because you will ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit and consult your emotions and make a decision that God is not concerned about. It is the hardest thing as a minister because right now I'm preaching one word. I promise you, if you interviewed 100 people when you left, they would all hear something different because you're hearing through the lens of your historical data and not the words that are actually coming out of my mouth. And instead of thinking about who I'm talking about, what if you just say, he's talking about me? What if you can get all the people in your head? I promise you, all of y'all got somebody in your head that ain't you. Oh, I wish such and such was here for this word. But guess what? They ain't here. Why? Because this is your word. Ooh, if Johnny was here today, ooh, I wish my husband would have came. He'd be better. Why don't you go home better? And maybe he'll want to come here and get better. But if you go to church all day and go back home still full of hell, he ain't coming. Let the church say, ain't that what you were planning to say? Amen. I'm still preaching. It is Black History Month, right? I said, is it Black History Month? Come on, people of God. You got to understand that he's taking you around this long route to confuse the enemies, not you. God could get you there right now if he wanted to. How, how long did it take him to heal the one with the issue of blood? So it had you deserved an instantaneous miracle, you would have got one. But that ain't your testimony. You need the route. Come on, guys. If, if, if you could handle a miracle where your hand was withered and five seconds later it wasn't, that, that would have been the one you got. But because you ain't made like that, you got to get Piharath, Migdal, Belzephan, and then to the Red Sea. Are you listening to me? This is why Sarah didn't have a baby. Because God told Sarah she was going to have a baby. What did she do? She laughed at God. Her intuition told her that she couldn't have a baby. And so here she is talking about, I can't have a baby, because she thought that God was consulting her fertility and not her faith. I know I'm preaching. So if this is going to be the year of manifested promises for you, you can't take what I'm saying and take it through your historical filter, and then produce a narrative that ain't got nothing to do with what I've been saying over the last few moments. 
What I am telling you is that God is not upset with you, that God is not trying to punish you. Even though the route seems long, he's trying to get you comfortable with the course because eventually he's going to take you right into the Red Sea. And your enemies are going to be behind you. And what does the Bible say happened when the children of Israel went through the Red Sea and Egypt went in behind them? What does the Bible say? It closed them in, which brings us to the last point. You got to get out of debt. You got to be okay with detours and get ready for departures. I want you to understand something. Pastor Torrance, when the Lord gave me this revelation, I jumped up out of my desk because I never knew this before. The Bible says in verse 5 that Pharaoh didn't even know they were gone. How you don't know I'm gone? All these pyramids I built for you? All this free labor you've been getting out of me? And you don't even know I'm not here anymore? Then the Lord told me to tell you. You don't belong anywhere where they didn't recognize you leaving. If people cannot appreciate your presence, they deserve your absence. They were gone. And he didn't even know it. And then he does something insane. He gets his chariots and horses to follow people he put out. Back then, you ain't want me. <laughs> I'm hot. Now I got this gold and stuff. You trying to holler at your boy. They gone, and he gets his chariots to go get them. And Pastor Raymond, this was the next revelation. You know why he chased them? It's because he saw, listen, his real wealth leaving. <laughs> Tony, he had all his money, all his chariots, all his pyramids. He left all of that behind to go chase some slaves. He saw his real wealth leaving. You around here asking God for wealth don't even realize you are wealth. You around here asking for things and you don't recognize you are the thing. I need everybody in this room and online to stop asking God to give you something you already are. You are his child, which means that you will enjoy the benefits of the kingdom. And I decree and declare that you are already what you're praying to be. You hear me, young lady? You ain't got to get to a certain age. You ain't got to get to a certain stage. You ain't waiting on nothing. Somebody say, I'm it. You don't believe it. Somebody say, I'm it. All the fellas say, I'm that dude. I don't know what, what do ladies say when they say that? I'm that, I'm that, I'm that girl. All the ladies say, I'm that girl. You got to snatch it though. You can't leave it up there. It's got to. You got to understand slavery it's what you were in, it's not who you are. And to come as far as you have come, considering where you started, there ought to be a joyful noise in this place today. <laughs> Somebody shout, I've come a long way.
Come here, Pastor Hammer. Come up here. Put, um, put verse 14 on the screen. That's what the Bible says, and I'm done with you. Moses, it's up there, the Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. This is the month of peace. Revelation time. The Lord, leave it up there, please. The Lord will fight for you. See, if this is peace, how can I fight for him and hold it? Either I got to lay my peace down and fight, or I got to hold my peace and let. Okay? Notice the Bible doesn't say, and you shall carry your peace. Notice it says, you shall hold your peace. Let me tell you the difference between hold and carry. Carry that water to me. Okay? Because the word carry gives the idea that I have to exert energy to pick it up and exert energy to get it to its location. But if I say hold your peace, it means that I have given you something that you don't have to exert energy to get. God told me to tell you, you're not going to have to work for peace in this season. He's going to give it to you. High five three people and say, God is going to give you peace. That went over some of y'all head. Because in order to get peace, some of y'all got to meditate. Some of y'all got to turn off the phone. You got to turn off. God says, you know what? I'm going to give you peace in your routine. All of a sudden, there's going to be a peace that comes over you that surpasses all understanding. God says, I'm going to give you peace. Slap three people and say, he's about to give you peace. He's about to give you peace. I'm just looking for somebody who's ready for it. God says, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you peace on your job. I'm going to give you peace in your house. I'm going to give you peace in your marriage. And here is the big one. Y'all ready? I'm about to give you peace in your mind. I need somebody to shout peace in this place. No, I'm not, I'm not going to shout for you. I, I'm, this ain't my peace. This is your peace. God says, I'm about to wipe your tears away. I'm about to deal with that turmoil in your heart. I'm about to deal with that confusion in your mind. I come up against the spirit of suicide. I come up against the spirit of depression. I come up against the spirit of jealousy. Somebody shout, I'm at peace with myself. All the peaceful people make some noise. Tell your neighbor, I'm gonna get some sleep tonight. I'm going to get some sleep tonight. You know why? Because I'm not going to be comparing myself to nobody. I'm not going to be worried about what nobody doing. I'm not going to be reading comments on, on Facebook. I'm not going to be counting somebody else's followers. All I know is that he gave me the gold. And the wealth of the wicked has been laid up for the righteous. And I'm getting ready to build something. I ain't got time to worry about what you're doing. I got to build what he gave me. Touch three people and say, build something, build something, build something. Build something, build something, build something. Build something, build something, build something. I don't know who this is for. I, I just saw a lady in my spirit. God told me to tell you that the lady who does your hair in the next 16 months, you're going to own the building she do it in. I don't know who that's for. You're going to own the building where you go get your hair done. So you're going to pay, but it's going to be the rent they pay you that's going to pay the beautician. I don't know who that's for. Somebody say, build something. I just saw somebody get a, a car lot. 
over here. Somebody owning a car lot on my left. I saw right over here. And sir, I don't know who you are. You got a white shirt on and a blue tie. God says you are an owner. I don't know what you're trying to do with your life. God says you are an owner. You are an owner. I don't know what. Come here. Bring him here. Come here. Tell him to come here. Drag him up here if you got to. Come here. I'm about to put some glory. Come here. I'm about to put glory. You're about to own whatever you're going after. I need the saints clapping right now. Because God's about to break a curse. And what the enemy had meant for you for evil, God says he's going to turn it around for your good. God says you are an owner. Forget what they think about you. Forget what they said about you. Forget what your past says. You are an owner. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He shouldn't even be here today. He shouldn't even be here today. But God says, I'm about to turn it around. I need somebody worshiping in this room today. We didn't come to make a spectacle. We came to break curses. Now, is you is or is you ain't? I need somebody. There's a shift about to happen in this room. There's a shift about to happen in this room. There's a shift about to happen in this room. I need everybody who understands that you're about to be called out of slavery into ownership. High five somebody say, I connect my faith with yours. Now tell them, look at me. Because here, Crystal, this is our favorite sentence. I remember, Crystal, I remember you said this one day right in this pulpit. This is right in this text. I want you to read it when you get home, verse 1 through 15. Here is the power of the text. Are you ready? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Here is the power of the text. God told me to tell you that the enemies that you see today, you shall see. Touch somebody say, the enemy that you see today, the poverty that you see today, the sickness that you see today, the word of the Lord is, you shall see it no more. Grab a neighbor by the hand. Shout neighbor. God told me to tell you, weeping may endure for a night, uh, but joy is coming in the morning. If you believe it, shout yeah. Uh, I told myself that this was a lecture that I was not going to preach that I was not going to hoop that I was not going to holler but when I think about what he's done for me uh, when I think about where he brought me from. Grab a neighbor by the hand and shout neighbor. God told me to tell you everything will be all right. What did they say? What they say? What did they say? You got the wrong neighbor. Find somebody else. Grab him by the hand and say neighbor. Everything is going to be all right. Did, did you see any tears come down their face? They cap it. Find somebody else. Look somebody and say, neighbor, I know he's all right. I feel something happening. I feel something happening. This is how you know I ain't in charge, because I swear I said I wasn't going to do it. Everything going to be all right. I just saw debt. I just saw it disappear. I just saw debt disappear. I just saw debt disappear. Hallelujah. I just saw tumors drying up. 
Somebody's got to go to the doctor Tuesday to find out if you have breast cancer. I decree and declare it won't be there when you get there because the angel is in the room. I need somebody in the room to find you a praise partner. Say, neighbor, over the next 30 seconds, open your mouth and give God the praise like it's already done. No, 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 no. That's the kind of praise when you're hoping for it to happen. I want you to shout like it's already done. Yeah. I just heard something. I just heard something. I'm sorry for y'all up front. I don't mean no harm by this, but here's what the Lord just told me to tell you. The miracle is in the back. I heard him. I need somebody in the nosebleeds to shout like you sitting courtside. Because by this time next year, this section is going to be reserved for you. Open your mouth. Now, everybody up front, I need you to shout for the people in the back. This is your year. This is your season. This is your time. Now, listen. Listen to me. Let me tell you what the enemy is doing. Let me show you what the enemy is doing. Sharon, I'm telling you. I need everybody in here right now, 35 and younger, to raise your hand. Look around. Let me tell you what the devil is doing to you. He has afflicted you with the slavery called imposter's syndrome. And what is happening, for those of you who are 35 and beneath, you're old enough to have friends older than you. So you see what's happening in their life. And you feel behind because you're not there yet. Here's what you need to know. When they were you, they were not there yet either. It's because you can't get there too quick. What would you do at 25 years old if God gave you everything on your vision board? And what is your plan for handling it if you receive it? Because you can get it, but how you going to keep it? You see? See this church? With all of its real estate, it's worth $20 million. But I got to have a lawyer that I pay $2,500 an hour to keep it. Because somebody's always trying to take it. And if you don't learn that you need protection before you need purses. If you don't know, bro, that you need legal advice before you got Gucci belts, then you will have your protection around your waist and you won't be protected from the wiles of the devil. I got to have four lawyers to stay afloat because somebody's always accidentally falling. Somebody's always seeing an opportunity. You don't have any idea how many policies and meetings and procedures it takes for us to have these two hours in peace. 
You think you know all the police officers in this room? You mistaken. You're sitting next to one that don't know it. Yeah, I know him, I know him, I know him. You think I'm dumb? You think I want you to know who they are? It takes so much just to operate. You walk in the door, everything's set. You don't have any idea how long they have to rehearse to give you 20 minutes worth of music. You don't know that they had to rehearse before they got here so that they could know the music when they showed up and how many phone calls back and forth for 20 minutes and how many spirits threaten that 20 minutes. I'm trying to work on your mindset. If you don't take nothing else from me, borrow my mindset. Bishop T.D. Jakes was 38 years old when he moved to Dallas. He was 40 before the Potter's House was known. And you got preachers around here who want what he has at 20. I remember one day I went to him and you, some of y'all heard me say this before. I'm like, you did this and you did that and I want to do this and I want to do that. He looked at me and he let me get it all out and he said, enjoy the distance. Because my question for you is, if you catch the person you admire, who's going to teach you? I don't know how I ended up here. No clue. I just woke up and it happened. One day I was sitting in a restaurant and people walked past me. The next day I walked in and people were sitting books on the table asking me to sign it. One day we were in this church and 500 people were watching us on YouTube. Next thing I knew, it was a million a week. And on my only job, amidst all of that, was to know that it was him doing it and it wasn't me. Because when I leave here and sit on the couch, my, my, my wife's still going, I ain't special. She's going to shout, hey, baby, can you bring me some water too? I got to take the garbage out. You hear me? And when I go to the car wash, they going to dry it off, but I got my own towels in the trunk because they don't do it like I can do it. You know what I mean? I got to... Touch your neighbor. I'm going to drive my own car. I don't care. I'm going drive my car. I'm trying to get you to understand the mindset. You hear me? Thinking is to doing as three is to one. That means for every one time you do it, you should have thought about it three times. If you think about buying it three times and you still feel like you can do it, go do it. Buyer's remorse is because you thought once, bought once. Now you get it home and then it don't even look the same at your house as it did in the store. And now it still got tags on it. And you're about to give it away. That was your wealth. You do not need the ones in every color. <laughs> no, come here. I'm talking to you. You don't need the Jordans in every color. Every time, oh, dog, they dropping the red ones. But your last pair was red and black. You can wear them again. Multiply your Jordan budget. Put it in an appreciating asset, and you could have bought Jordan stock.
Are you listening to me? This is as real as it get. Maybe you didn't come to church for this today. But I came for it. I came to challenge you, Israel, as you get out of Egypt and you finally get the bag, can you build before you buy? Can you put something up for a rainy day? Because let me tell you, it is going to rain. Are you listening to me? And I pray that God will breathe on your inventions. I, take, I pray that God will breathe on your clothing line. I pray that he would breathe on your jewelry line. I pray that he would breathe on the concept and the dream that you have in your head. But let me tell you something. He cannot drown Pharaoh until you drown your mindset. Because Israel's biggest problem is they were getting ready to get out of Egypt. And without the detour, they was getting ready to turn Canaan into Egypt. The questions they start asking, where the manna at? Ain't no, ain't no bread gonna fall from the sky. Where the water coming out of rocks? Why is he not turning bittersweet water? Because you're gonna have to go get it, Rachel. Somebody say, go get it. I hope that you heard the words of my heart. And I hope that you felt like it was your father sitting you in the living room giving you a good talking to, as they would say. I didn't want you leaving here enthusiastic about where you are because if you stay enthusiastic about where you are, you'll stay complacent and stay. I want you disgusted with your outcomes. I want you to start saying to yourself, I deserve more than this. I want you to start realizing that you were created for a purpose and that it is your job to discover that purpose come hell or high water and I don't want you to be afraid to discover who you are. And I want you to be done with the pursuit of trying to replicate somebody because what you will find out is that you think they are in a place they are actually not at. You chasing a ghost. You're chasing a ghost. They don't even have what they're pretending to have. All right, all right. You hear me, ma'am? Because out of all of this, the gold is the cheapest part of the text. It's the peace. Because when you're not in debt, you got peace. When you know that God will change the route, you got peace. When you know that eventually you're going to come out, you got peace. So just hold it and wait on the Lord. He shall renew your strength. I go to sleep every night at peace. At peace. Even if I got problems, I'm going to bed. Yes, sir. I'm going to bed. I didn't got so at peace now I'm doing stuff like taking naps. I used to didn't take naps. I fell asleep on the couch yesterday. Scared me when they shot the gun on the TV. Before I knew I was asleep. I used to try to stay up. I, I didn't like to even take naps. I felt like I had to be doing something. So when sleep would come over me, I would fight it. My wife taught me don't fight it because she, she don't fight it. So we... She, she was laying there yesterday. I looked over there. She was woke. Next thing I know, I was asleep. I woke up. She was still woke because I didn't adopt her spirit. I'm going to sleep. Because rest, rest is necessary. You can't think tired. You can't operate tired. You can't function tired. You can't treat people right tired. Are you listening to me? Okay. So what we going to do? We're going to build before we buy. That's what we're going to do. 
And it ain't got to be big. Marlon, it ain't got to be big. It can start out as a hole in the wall. You can start out in the corner. It don't have to be big, but we're going to build. And when I, when I see you matriculating through these next years, as I pass you and you pass me, I'm not going to ask you how you're doing. I'm going to ask you, what are you building? What are you building? It doesn't have to be built, but what are you building? What are you doing with the goal you got when you came out of Egypt? How many of y'all have goals? How many of y'all have dreams? How many of y'all have aspirations? Look around, keep your hands up. Everybody has them. So because you have a dream doesn't make you special. Just because you have a goal, that doesn't make you special. Just because you have aspirations, that doesn't make you How many of y'all gonna do something about it? Brothers, I want you building. Ladies, I want you building. Even if you got somebody to take care of you, build something just in case they change their mind. You better hear what I'm telling you. You don't know what people thinking. I know what he told you. I'm going to take care of you the rest of your life. <laughs> Get in the right fight. Life is over. You'd be surprised how somebody can change their mind about you. You'd be surprised. I ain't saying be untrusting. I'm just saying. You better hear your boy. Young people, teenagers, stop spending your money on all that stuff. Put you some dollars back. Me and my wife talk about this with the, with the kids all the time, like we make them save money. You're not spending it. We're going to force a habit on you so that way when you get 20, you don't call back here because I'm not answering. I done taught you. The last time, my mother's right there, the last time that money has had to transfer from her hand to mine, I was 17 years old. From that day until now, she has not had to support me ever. Is that the truth? She dropped me off at college, went and bought me a, a, a mattress and a box spring and a headboard a dresser, y'all remember the dresser with the mirror on the back? How many y'all, y'all press, you still got one in your house right now. The, the ones that come with that mirror on it with them thing, you got to screw it on there. We bought all of that for $200. <laughs> she dropped me off. Somebody gave me some furniture for the apartment. Mama got in that 1990 Astro van that was turquoise that we couldn't roll the window up on the way to her dropping me off, it was raining, the rain was coming in the window and it was freezing cold. And all y'all know if you've been in a car like that, the, the fog starts steaming up the windows. And when she dropped me off in that condition, I decreed she wouldn't pick me up in the same. And she did not. She did not. I bought my first house while I was in college. I bought my first car while I was in college. Let me tell you what I did, and then I'm going to pray for you. When I got my scholarship check, I bought a condo. Y'all not listening to me. I didn't get a credit card at the Bursar's office like some of y'all did. I bought a $89,000 condo with my scholarship money and sold it and had an income-producing property and pastoring a church while I was a senior in college. Don't tell me you gotta wait. I ain't new to this, I'm true to this. I've been thinking like this a long time. Now, if you are absent of that kind of mindset, I want you to meet me at this altar because I wanna pray to break curses off of your life. If it's not you, stay where you are. This prayer gonna be quick. Wait on the Lord, 
serious moment I, I knew something was going to happen the moment I drove up here today when I drove up I saw it I saw it and what I saw were strongholds like literally breaking because here's what I know. Please hear me. I will, this will not be long. Five minutes and we're done. Hold me to it. What we're dealing with is a stronghold. And it is so tough that no matter what I say or preach, it has difficulty penetrating. I, I just, I saw like, like a, a, a barrier of skin where the word would hit and fall. See, this is why in the Old Testament, Lonnie, they had to be circumcised. It's because the flesh was the tearing away, the rolling back. I'm asking God, please, Jesus, to circumcise the hearts of those who are at the altar. Remove the barrier that keeps the glory from getting in. This is what the Bible means when it says we are hard-hearted. It means that no matter how much information you get, it and drops. How many of y'all feel like that sometimes? Be honest. It just can't get through because you have more faith in your system than you do your Savior. The way you have been protecting yourself is the reason why God can't get you out of the misery. I brought you up here to pray for one thing, that whatever the barrier is that the enemy has built in your life, whatever that wall of Jericho is, I'm praying in the next two minutes and 47 seconds it falls down because the next time I see you at this altar, you're going to be up here praying about how to keep it, not how to get it. Help me, Holy Ghost. Now, the Bible says that when Pharaoh came after the children of Israel, ch challenge me on this, the Bible says he came out with a high hand. This is what I want you to do in the next two minutes. I want you to make ready to come out of what you're in with a high hand, a high praise and a high sound. And what the enemy meant for evil, God is about to turn it around for your good. Do I have any faith believers at the altar? All right, over the next one minute and 50 seconds, come out with a high voice and a high hand. Come on, open up your mouth. We're getting ready to come out of this thing. We're getting ready to come out of this thing. Come on. We're not playing games. Put your heart on the altar. Put your psychology on the altar. Put your distrust on the altar. Come on, come on, lay it down. Lay a 
aside every weight that doth easily beset you. Come on, come on, this is your moment. This is your year. Do not pass me by. Come on, I can't shout you through this one. You're going to have to do it yourself. Come on, you got another minute and 15 seconds. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Come on, Lighthouse Church. Come on, Lighthouse Nation. Come on, daughter. Come on, son. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Do not be afraid. Be courageous. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Come on, you got 40 seconds. I can't hear nobody crying out. I can't hear nobody crying out. I want you to shout until the stronghold breaks. I want you to shout until your heart can be penetrated by the word of God. Lay aside every weight that doth easily beset you. Come on, you got 10 seconds, come on. Come on, Holy Ghost. Work in this room. Five. The chains are about to break. Four. The Spirit is about to move. Two. Now, when I say one, I want you to release a sound that makes the devil nervous. One. Shout. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. I need all of the free people who felt it come off, who felt those demons leave your spirit, who felt those warlocks leaving your family alone, who felt that curse break, who felt your heart be penetrated by the Holy Ghost. This is your year of manifested promises. Let the redeemed of the Lord. I said, let the redeemed of the Lord. I said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hallelujah. 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 Now you're going to have to praise him here because the demons are looking for a new host. The demons are looking for somewhere to go. I need you to let the demons know my body is off limits. My mind is off limits. My children are off limits. We cast the demons into the pigs and over the cliffs. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody shout, I'm free. Somebody shout, I'm free. Somebody shout, my daughter's free. My son is free. My grandchild is free. My nephew is free. My niece is free. My grandparents are free. My mind is free. My future is free. My past is past. My tomorrow is guaranteed. Somebody say, Lord, work on me, 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 work on me. Because I'm not an easy case. Work on me, work on me, work on me, work on me. I decree it in the name of the Father, the name of the Son. And in the name of the Holy Ghost, that this will be a day to remember. Do not play with this moment. I want you to bring every thought into captivity. Everything the devil's trying to make you think about other than this moment, I, I need you to command your mind to take charge of your future. Jesus. Whew. 
and there shall be latter rain. This church will never be the same. I heard the Lord say wealth is about to come out of this house. And what you going to do when you get it? We're going to buy later. But we're going to build. Next time they see us, they're going to be buying, but they're going to be buying from you. How many of y'all got a clothing line in your spirit? How many of y'all got that? People need clothes. We're getting ready to give. They gave it to the tabernacle. One of the responsibilities of wealth is to make sure that you lend to the poor, but with a different spirit. You see? And the reason why you give to the poor is because you remember being one of them. <laughs> but you... And when I mean say when I say poor though, did you know you can be poor in spirit? See, people have the wrong idea about what prosperity is. It ain't money. Money. Do you know that's the cheapest thing in this room? One day the dollar can be worth something, the next day it can be worth something else. But the peace of God that surpasseth all understanding. The Bible says in the book of John, peace I give you. It's about to give you peace. God bless these gifts and these givers that this next seed we sow is going to break generational curses. We're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're about to set ourselves up so Peter and Paul can pay us. My children will not graduate college with debt. I'm going to be comfortable with the detours. And I'm going to get ready for departures. When you go back to your seat, I want you to get your gift because we're going to give it together. I am decreeing and declaring a financial shift of wealth in this house and online today. I want you online to get ready right now. Go to your seats. Don't leave. We're getting ready to give and we're going home. Shower down. Send your spirit, Lord. Say rain. When you get your gift ready, I want you to stand on your feet. Oh, breathe. Shower down, send your spirit, Lord. Come on, rain. Oh, breathe. Shower down, shower down, send your spirit. I want you to. Get your gift. I want you to stand to your feet. We're going home. Before you buy, what are you going to do? I know the next question, Pastor. What, what do I build? What's in your heart? What would you build if money wasn't an option? or an obstacle, what would you build? What would you do 
If God said, if you think of it, I'm going to do it. Well, that's what you do. That's what you do. Hold your gift up in the air. As I move towards greater, I will accept all divine ideas, thoughts, and concepts that will connect me to my destiny. I believe that what Jesus Christ has done for me is bigger than what anyone has, can, and will do to me. Because of his full gift, I will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. Pass your gifts to my right, your left. Please don't leave. Say rain. Shower down, shower down, shower down, send your spirit, send your spirit, say rain, shower down, shower down, send your spirit. If you're in this place today, and you've not accepted Christ as your Savior, this is the most important moment of your life. If God sent you here, and you believe that this is a place where you should grow and connect, there are two ways you can come in. You can come in through what we call the community. That's supporting the local church and attending periodically and giving when the Lord moves you. But if you want to be a part of the core, we, we volunteer weekly, we, we give weekly, we attend. Sing. The Lighthouse Church is a part of God's kingdom. You can be a part of what we're doing in Nebraska. Or you know, we gave $25,000 to a church in Pakistan last week where 97% of the nation is Islamic we invested in Christianity in that neighborhood in that area this is really about the gospel so if you're in this place today and you're anywhere in this room and online they're going to put instructions on how you can become a part of what we're doing or let us become a part of what you're doing. I want you to come from wherever you are in this building, the balcony in the back, from the left, from the right. If you say, I want to be in this place, I want to mark this as my territory. This is the church I want to join. This is where I want to raise my family. I want you to come from wherever you are. And we're going to praise God as you walk out in that aisle. God bless you, sister. God bless you. Come on, Lighthouse, make it a big deal. All you got to do is find one of these people. They will take you where you need to go. Is there somebody else? God bless you. Come on, make it a big deal. Make it a big deal. Make it a big deal. It's a family reunion. It's a family reunion. God bless you, sister. Right this way. Right this way. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you. Come on, they're still coming. They're still coming. God bless you. Hallelujah. 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 Right this way. There's someone else. The devil lost again. 
He's a loser. And he's defeated. They're still coming. Praise God for them. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else that's still coming and we still worshiping? This is what we came for. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody love Jesus? Thank you so much for tolerating the challenge. The Word of God not only reproves, but it rebukes. And people of color, it's our time to not just be reciting Martin Luther King's speech, but it's time that we realize the dream. And we're going to see it in this lifetime. Do you believe it? On your way home, I want you to pray that not one jot or tittle of this word would hit the ground. That the Lord would allow it to be firmly planted in your heart. I challenge you to ride home in silence. Don't even turn on music that's going to rob you of the mindset that the Lord just downloaded in you. I was talking with Kim. Uh, for those that when I drove up, I saw so many people getting turned away and going around and uh, the Dream Center, they're starting to paint the walls now. Come on and praise God that we got paint going up. So we'll be able to have um, initially about 700, eventually about 1,400 additional seats in the Dream Center so people don't have to turn around and go home. They can worship right here on campus with us. Come on and praise God for that. But you know what comes additional people, comes in additional parking spaces. So we got to build another parking lot. So if you see all the ground tore up out there, we're working on that as well. Um, and then last but not least, I think the ladies will be happy about this. We're about three to six weeks away from getting the permits. We're going to redo all of the bathrooms in the, in the building. And it's going to look like the post oak in here, I'm telling you. The bathrooms are going to be off the chain. How many of y'all uh, go to Bucky's? Anybody go to Bucky's? And they say you go there for the bathrooms. People are going to be like, I'm going to the lighthouse to use the bathroom. I mean, they're going to be off the chain. And so we're, we're, we're wanting the house of God to be excellent. Amen, somebody. Amen. The toilets ought to work in the house of God, shouldn't they? Amen. And, and, and we're going to do that. And as long as you are faithful in your giving, we're going to continue to be faithful and our adjustments. Also, what's, what's the first Sunday in March? First fruit. Uh, for those of you all who are not doing one week, one month, um, uh, our paycheck, we're doing the year, 2024. That's, that's our entry. If you don't have that, it's 224. That's our first fruit. And God is going to bless your resources for the rest of the year. And this is, the wealth transfer is coming. Don't get wealthy and stingy. It doesn't, it doesn't work together. You gotta, you gotta be liberal in your giving. Freely you give, freely you receive. That's the word of God. God dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Allow each and every one of us to get home and find everything in order. Be with us both now and forever. And all of God's people say it. Amen. Hug somebody on your way out. Tell them I love you. And ain't nothing you can do about it. God bless you.
going to happen here with our brother Brandon Adams. So listen, we know uh, this is one of our ministers here at the Lighthouse Church. Guys, the sermon today was amazing. So let's just discuss it real quickly. Pastor Ken talked about debt, right? He talked about detours and he talked about departures. And listen, with the debt, what he what stuck out to me was he's basically just trying to get your mind right about money. How how that sounds to you, bro? Yeah, absolutely. I think that most times we put debt in this negative category, right. but it's only because we don't understand how to use debt yes, in the right way. And so when we understand that debt can actually be good and the, the proper way to accumulate that debt yeah. so that that way it can work as an asset for you, right. when you put it in the right position, it can work for you instead of you just accumulating debt so that you can go and buy and spend yeah. versus getting things that you can add value to yeah. and create wealth. Yeah. With. So, see, y'all gonna have to go back and listen to that because a lot of not a lot of y'all knew that debt can be good for you. We're talking about consumer debt versus debt that can actually be your friend. That Pastor Ken said, "I'm not making it up." He yeah. said it in the sermon. Debt can be your friend. Yeah. What about detours? What about when God is transitioning you? Um, one of the things that was said to me that I got out of the sermon was that listen, when God sends you on a detour, He's taking you away from your enemies. While he deals with them, you're on a detour and you're learning the language of where he's taking you, yeah, you know? Absolutely. So, I think that, you know, with the detours, when you're going on detours in your life, you have the opportunity to discover yeah. who God has really purposed you to be. Right, right. Those detours can keep you away from di different hurts and harms and dangers, right. but it gives you the ability to understand who God designed you to be so that you can walk in purpose once he gets you back on that right path yes, to sir. where he got you going. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so then another part of the sermon, we talked about debt. We talked about detours, and he also talked about departure. And listen... I know people like this. I know y'all like this part. Listen, if people don't appreciate your presence, then they deserve your absence. I know what kind of people y'all y'all. Y'all like to hear that kind of stuff. Yeah. That blessed me. I hope it blessed y'all. Did yeah. it bless you? Oh, it blessed me tremendously because you want to be where you're celebrated and not tolerated. Absolutely. And so when you get in an environment that is conducive to others who love and appreciate you for who you are and what you've done and yeah. all that you can be, then you, you, you get in a place where... God can move through other people and move through you so that you can be a blessing to others and for everything that he's done in your life. Yes, yes. So it, it, it's, it's, it blessed me tremendously. Yeah. So guys, listen, it, it's no way for us to get it all in right here and right now. So we're just going to leave you with that. But listen, don't forget, we are in the year of manifested promises. This is the month of peace. And listen, PK said this, you're not going to have to work for it. God's going to give it to you and you just have to hold on to it. So I want you to declare this for the month of peace. Declare that I have peace and it will never end. And then for the rest of the sermon, guys, join us tonight, 7 p.m. on YouTube. Make sure you're subscribed to Keon Henderson TV. As a matter of fact, also make sure you are following Pastor Keon on Instagram. Make sure you're following the Lighthouse Church on Instagram. And then even when you subscribe to YouTube, you'll be able to see the 10 at 10 on Mondays. So, guys, we're going to be seeing you all throughout the week. So, listen, have a blessed week. We'll see you later on. Hey, guys, we had an awesome word today. See you tonight at 7, and we love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about it.